ask yourself, what do you need? So rather than being codependent on our bosses, our colleagues, our children, our spouse, or whomever it is, we have the opportunity to provide ourselves with whatever we need rather than trying to take energy from others. I get to give myself what I need every day. And that to me is true power. Welcome to Evolve Leadership, the arena where high achieving leaders are challenged to redefine their limits. My name is Angus Nelson. I grew up in the United States and I now live in Lisbon, Portugal. I'm an executive coach and I've spent my career advising and training leaders from startups to Fortune 500 companies. And here's what I've learned. An old, ineffective leadership framework will always keep you on a hamster wheel, consumed with work-life balance, burnout, and stress. Here on the show, each week we'll help you rethink the path to achievement. We'll help you discover new principles, new philosophies to the modern leader. Look, the world is relentlessly changing, demanding a new era of leaders. It's time to redefine your limits. So enter the arena, my friend. It's time to evolve. Well, hello there. Welcome to the Evolve Leadership Show. I'm Angus Nelson, your host. Today, we're going to get a little spiritual. We're going to talk about a wellness concept or or a framework around some of the areas that many of us never give time or attention to. This area of consciousness, this area of energy, this area of seeing and feeling and being something within from an energetic level, from, again, almost a spiritual context. If this is an area that maybe you're unfamiliar with, I think this is an excellent entry into understanding some of these things that maybe perhaps before you would see them as a little woo or a little outside of your your comfort zone. We're going to go deep into a conversation with someone who is an expert in the space. She's done some stuff with Deepak Chopra. She's done stuff uh, for num- with a number of other big names. And in addition... She's had her own podcast. She's been on stages. She's had her own show and she lives right here in Lisbon, Portugal. So I get to see her uh, more often than some of the other guests I've had on the show. Her name is Jennifer K. Hill. I'm super excited for you to be in her presence, to uh, be around her charm and hear her wisdom as she invites us into this understanding of who we truly are beyond all the labels, beyond all the work that we do to activate this more powerful self. Let's jump into that interview right now. Well, hey there, Jennifer. Welcome to the show. Oh, thank you so much, Angus. I'm so grateful to be here with you. And what's even more phenomenal is like we're here on screen, but like we've actually shared coffee in real life here in Lisbon uh, because you live here as well. Yes, despite the fact that I actually arrived at the coffee shop to meet you the first time, and then I called you frantically saying, oh my gosh, Angus, I'm so sorry. I'm a mile away. The Uber dropped me in the wrong place. Give me 10 minutes. I'll be right there. And you being your gracious, wonderful self said, no problem. So I order another Uber, get in the Uber, and it was like Groundhog Day. So the Uber drives around and around, and then I get out of the car in the same spot that I had been picked up. And I said, sir, I think something's wrong here. And he said, ma'am, you put in the wrong address. So it was some new building. But the point is, I think I'm one of the few people who has paid to take an Uber driver literally back to my original destination and found you nonetheless. Which is so great because you were just like half a block or just a couple hundred feet from where we were. It just wasn't as obvious. And to take an Uber around the block, I love that story. And uh, yeah, and then we got to talk and going deep into some other areas, which we're going to talk about today. I'm super excited because the elements of some of the things that you are an expert at is some of the stuff that some people don't understand fully. In particular, I want to talk about kind of this concept of health and wellness in the concept of energy and woo, as some people think of it. Like, what is all this stuff that actually plays into our life, but most people don't identify that this is the stuff that's actually shaping us? So if you could just take a second just to kind of explain some of your philosophy around you know, how this builds resilience and how this shows up in our life. It's a great question, Angus, and it's one of my favorite topics. I 
think that when we all went through the pandemic, the flashlight was finally shined on mental health and mental illness. Now, despite you and I living in Lisbon, I was recently reading a statistic that said 87% of U.S. workers suffer from work-related stress, such as anxiety and depression. And this was a relatively recent study post-COVID, if I recall correctly. And I think what happened was we all had to be still for the first time in perhaps our whole lives, unless maybe we had done a silent retreat or something of that nature in the past. And it's in the stillness that we can begin to hear our bodies, hear our inner knowing, our inner voice, our higher self, whatever you choose to call it. And I think that this is really the greatest opportunity we've had as human beings to evolve to a new level that we've never reached before. And that really begins, number one, with our consciousness. How do we evolve our consciousness as business leaders, as friends, as lovers, as parents, as employees? We have this opportunity to evolve our consciousness. And I think it's fascinating that it's so easy to live in this immediate gratification society where we blame or shame or guilt people if something didn't arrive right now, if something didn't get done. And most importantly, we uh, blame and shame and guilt ourselves. And I think that what this crisis is teaching us is that the more we can cultivate the inner stillness, the inner knowing, the inner voice, the inner wisdom, the greater business leaders we're gonna become, the greater parents, the better friends, the better spouses, take your pick. And that's really what I live my life by. Uh, as you may know, I think we were talking about this when we were having coffee. My father had passed away recently, and a lot of people have been incredible reaching out from around the world with their love and support. And I feel extremely peaceful about it because thanks to COVID, it was actually during uh, 2020. I remember I was living in London very unexpectedly. I had sold my first company in 2018. Late 2019, I was able to move into a remote consulting role. And before the debacle with COVID happened, I had a year long trip planned around the world, Bali and South Africa and Europe and all over the place. And then of course, March 12th happened of 2020 and everybody was in a panic. And all I wanted to do was get to the nearest English speaking country, which I was in Paris. So I hopped on the train to London. And the greatest catalyst that came out of that for me, aside from the inner knowing and reflection and the quiet time I took every day, was that my mom and dad and I started Skyping before Zoom became a thing. It was Skype back in 2020. And it's really about human connection. There's a lack of intimacy epidemic that's happening around the world. And I think for those of us who are willing to tap into our higher consciousness, we can cultivate that meaningful, deeper connection, not only with ourselves, though also for the, with the people we love and the people we work with and the people we surround ourselves with. And the human connection, like, let's take this to this, this realm of uh, connecting, not just with others, but also to ourselves. And we're coming out of the pandemic, people have isolated, people are in, you know, a different state. And now we're moving back into this world where it's a hybrid kind of world. Some people are coming back into the office, some people um, have, you know, chosen or had the opportunity to continue to work remote. And on both sides, it's that connectedness with other people that first starts with connecting with ourselves. You've done a lot of work in this area. How would you help someone who, you know, doesn't even necessarily have this consciousness that you speak of? How do they discover, how do they connect to understanding that for themselves? There are three easy tools that I can offer to our listeners and viewers today. The first tool is Let's say you feel afraid of meditation. A lot of people I talk to, I tell them I meditate one to two hours every day and people go, ah, that sounds terrible. How do I do that? And I was that person 20 years ago. I remember when my uh, masseuse at the time, a dear friend of mine, Natalia, I was getting ready for a massage and she said, Jen, if you spend 20 or 30 seconds meditating before the massage, it'll be much better. And I'm like, are you crazy? Do you know how fast my brain is working all the time? I can't quiet my mind for three seconds, let alone 20 or 30. And now fast forward, of course, I've been meditating for 11 years. So for those of you out there who might feel a little bit intimidated or you know, put off by, oh gosh, I don't know if I can do that. That is one of my favorite tools. And I recommend tools like Insight Timer, lots of great meditations on there, Transcendental Meditation. 
And if that feels a little lofty for you to start, something I learned from a, a brilliant, actually meditation and otherwise teacher of the Braha Kumara, Sister Jenna, is spending one or two minutes in silence every day. That's it. You can set a reminder on your phone just to stop, pause, breathe, and just be with yourself. Just put your phone down, put your computer away, turn off your music, turn off the TV, whatever you're doing, and just be for one or two minutes. And if you start with that, Sister Jen actually taught me what they do in the Brahat Kumaris, is at the top of every hour throughout the day. It's not just once a day they do it, but they do it every single hour at the top of the hour for anywhere from one to three minutes. So that's one thing that you could possibly do is spending time in the quiet solitude. The second thing, of course, as I mentioned, is meditation. There is no right or wrong way to meditate. You could go for a walking meditation, spending time in quiet reflection in nature, just turning your phone off for a few minutes, going for a walk with your dog or your kids, or whatever it might be, and just spend a little quiet time or by yourself. And then the third one, one of my favorite ones that really helped me to cultivate a deeper and more meaningful relationship with myself and to love myself. I was the person, as you know, Angus, I think we talked about this when we met. I was bulimic from 15 to 25. I was so self-deprecating, self-loathing, hated myself inside and out, was suicidal, tried three times to kill myself between 18 to 21. So I'm not speaking to you up here from some high soapbox. I'm telling you firsthand, this is what helped me to survive and to actually be with you today. So meditation, taking time in silence. And the third one is inner child work. That was really one of the biggest things that helped me to get to know myself. It's very easy. I'll give you what my teacher taught me about six or seven years ago is you can either look at a picture of yourself at a certain age, if you have a certain picture you love, or maybe one on social, it doesn't really matter. And you could be five years old, three years old, seven or 10, just see whatever age, whatever picture you're drawn to. Or the other option is you can shut your eyes and visualize yourself at a certain age and just go with the first age that comes to you there. I've done inner child work on myself at 19 years old, at 13 years old, at five years old. So there is no right or wrong way. Whatever one you're called to is the perfect place to begin. And for those of you who want to know how to do it, you put your right hand on your heart and your left hand on your abdomen. You could do one or the other. For some women, they like to put their left hand on the abdomen or just the right hand on the heart. You could do both or one or the other. And you begin to get to know yourself. I was just doing this at a keynote for a bunch of executives who run law firms in LA. It was such an honor to get to you know, share this wisdom that I had learned on resilience and how to become more deeply connected to ourselves so that we can foster more meaningful relationships with others. And so you begin by talking to yourself. And if you have to introduce yourself, in fact, one of my friends and teachers who taught me this, she said she had had such a traumatic upbringing, Angus, that when she went to go connect to her inner child the first time, she was hiding behind a tree for 30 days. She wouldn't even come out. This little girl was like kind of hiding and peeking because she had been so traumatized when she was younger. So be patient with whatever version of yourself shows up. Some little inner, inner children, they, them, she, he, whoever it is, they might want to interact with you immediately. Some might need a little bit more coaxing and patience. And so then you get to know yourself and you just say, hi, you know, I'm Jen. I'm an older version of you. What do you want to be called, sweetheart? Or whatever it is. In my case, my uh, inner child loves to be called sweetheart. If you call her sweetie, she will murder you. <laughs> but if you call her sweetheart, like, or if, you know, you have to call her young lady. She doesn't like anything referencing to her being a child. And so you get to develop this relationship with yourself. And over time, what's really extraordinary that I noticed for me in particular, because I found out about seven, eight years ago, I was neurodiverse and high functioning on the spectrum. 22 year old, 40 year old, 30 something year old Jennifer, I often, Angus, had no idea, zero idea how I was feeling. So now, because I've been doing this for about six, seven years or longer, I'll ask myself every day, I'll start off by greeting her, Hi, sweetheart, how are you doing today? And then I'll often ask her, how are you feeling, my love? And Angus, it blows my mind. Sometimes 43-year-old Jennifer is sitting here before you, and I think I'm fine. And she says, I'm really angry with blah, 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 or I'm sad. And I'm like, what? <laughs> like, I had no idea I was angry or sad. And then I do some deeper dive work into it. And 99.9% .9 of the time, it's very accurate. 
So you would cultivate this deep relationship in the same way that you would date your spouse, boyfriend, girlfriend, whomever it might be. You want to cultivate that same meaningful relationship with yourself. And in fact, when I was going through a divorce about six years ago, one of my best friends gave me the best advice I'd ever given, been given. And she said, Jennifer, you deserve to find someone who will cherish you. So first, you need to cherish yourself. So a couple things. Step one, introduce yourself. Get to know yourself. Step two, ask yourself, what are you feeling? Step three, and this is the one that makes you the sexiest beast alive. Ask yourself, what do you need? So rather than being codependent on our bosses, our colleagues, our children, our spouse, or whomever it is, we have the opportunity to provide ourselves whatever with whatever we need rather than trying to take energy from others. And I've worked with many clients, men and women on this from the coaching perspective and from teaching and speaking about this for decades, or not decades, but probably five, seven years now. It is extraordinary. When we start to do this, it's almost like you're glowing because I'm not trying to get anything from Angus or from the audience or whomever. I love myself. And anything my husband gives me is simply the cherry on top. Anytime I get the puppy kisses all over my face when I wake up in the morning, that's just like a little whipped cream. I get to give myself what I need every day. And that to me is true power. The aspect of having everything you need is such a foreign concept to many of the you know, people that we work with at Evolve Leadership from the context that so many times it's a performance. It's, it's a quest, a striving, a hustle, a grind to create and to manufacture and to validate you know, our power and our being through the activity. And we think the more activity we do, the more valuable perhaps that we might be. And what I've observed is that that is this dependence on other people, whether it be people pleasing, whether it be through, you know, these external words of encouragement or affirmation, they need some other cheerleader, they need some outside source that proves that they have a place in this world. And secondarily, is because of that, people will work themselves to the bone into burnout, into, you know, exhaustion, into, you know, breaking down emotionally, anxiety attacks and things of that nature, because of this exertion for this external thing that they're never going to find. It's like this hamster wheel and they're chasing harder and faster, you know, over and over and over again, trying to get to this thing, this carrot, whatever they put in front of them. I just mixed a mouse thing with a horse or donkey thing, <laughs> but you know, it's like we're, we're chasing after this thing and this element or understanding that when you get someone to realize you're so powerful, the chaos you're experiencing, you create it. And you're, because you're so powerful, you can create a different reality too. And when that shift happens, right? When you can understand, when you can see like, this could be different. This, I can see this or experience this a different way. What a, it's like a mind, I don't know, to them, it's a mind fuck. To me, it's a mind liberation. For you, what was the transition for your understanding to say, oh my gosh, I can access this thing inside of me that's far more powerful than I give it credit. I can't say, Angus, that there was per se a moment, you know, that before and after I had many moments, many little micro moments that led to the bigger moments. For me, it was cataclysmic and transformational in around 2018. It was the year I sold my company, the year I asked my husband for a divorce, and the year I met my now husband. So all of that happened and the year I was diagnosed with being uh, autistic. And so all of that happened in 2018. And I feel like a lot of it for me came when I found out I was high functioning on the spectrum. I'll always remember sitting in the office of my dear, dear friend who recently passed away, God rest his soul, Mark Wolston, who was one of the most famous psychiatrists in the world. He, his claim to fame, many of which he actually had several, uh, was that he had never lost a patient in the history of his 40, 50 plus year career to suicide ever. And he was working at hospitals, he was a hostage negotiator, all sorts of incredible things. And I remember him sitting there and I'm sitting on the couch in his office and he was mentoring me through divorce. And so here I am, just sold the company, just decided to leave my ex-husband. And Mark says, Jen, 
don't want you to take this the wrong way. I love you, my friend. So there's a high likelihood that you're high functioning on the spectrum and neurodiverse. And I'm like, did you just speak Japanese to me? Like, what are you even saying? I don't even know what any of these words mean. And the moment I started researching it, and he said to go get a second opinion, which I did, and the woman validated it. And the moment that I found that out, I found my tribe. I've been very outspoken about it. I'm part of a group called the Octopus Movement of 6,000 members around the world. I gave a talk last year to a mastermind group of uh, business entrepreneurs in Croatia. And of the 30 people who were at this private talk I was giving, five came out to me after the talk, uh, not only physically immediately after, but months after and said, Jennifer, out of your talk, I realized I was on the spectrum. Like one woman that changed her life. She had just sold her company or IPO'd it for a billion dollars. And it transformed her relationship with her husband, with herself. She lost 40 pounds. You know, there's all these things that when we stop making ourselves wrong, I think that to your point about people pleasing, we're often trying to shove this round peg in the square hole. And when we give ourselves permission to be and embrace our quirkiness, whether you're neurodiverse or not, neurodiverse is just a fancy term for saying that your brain works in an atypical way to the way that most people's brains work. It doesn't really mean anything, though it gave me permission to own my weirdness, own my quirkiness, and to stop trying to be perfect and fit in. Because I, I just shared this actually on a LinkedIn post in an interview I did on my podcast, that it was like everybody else got a book on how to be a human, and mine was blank inside. So the only thing I could do, Angus, was mimic other people. Most of my young adult life, I would I literally couldn't do something or I would fail at it miserably unless I could mimic watching somebody else do something. And then because of my brain and the way it processes patterns and details, I could mimic till the cows came home. The mimicking was not authenticity. So it's really been only in the last six, seven years or so that I've stepped into and embraced my authenticity and given myself permission to be me, which I didn't even know what that was before that. Before we continue, I want to acknowledge something important. By listening to this show, you are taking a step that many leaders are frankly unwilling to do, and that is invest in yourself. And to honor your commitment, we want to invest in you. Our research shows that elite leaders excel in six core areas, and we've developed a quick two-minute assessment to help you highlight your strengths, uncover your blind spots, and see how you stack up against other top leaders. You'll get a personalized report that pinpoints the areas you can address to evolve into that next level leader. So to see where your leadership stands, go to rankmyleadership.com. Now, back to the show. I think there's great uh, liberation when one can understand that you're not broken. And to understand that our idiosyncrasies or our challenges or our experiences are actually there to shape us, to create us, to form us, to make us the unique powerhouse that we are. And I've, I've worked with so many high performers who don't understand that the weakness that they may be feeling or the fear that they're experiencing, that's a big one, the fear or the imposter syndrome. And they think, I'm this, you know, badass mofo. Like I should not be experiencing this. And it's like, no, no, at every level, there's a new devil. And that thing is an invitation for you to this higher echelon of being. And you must go through this fire, this tuition to get to that graduation. This thing that's before you in some form is something you asked for. You wanted to become this kind of leader. You wanted to become this kind of human. You wanted to become this kind of spouse or parent. So this is just to help you along the way to learn something, to gain something, to become wiser, smarter, faster. And yet, when we're always measuring ourselves amongst other people, measuring ourselves amongst our own like false expectations or unrealistic expectations, it's like we hold ourselves captive and we keep, our, keep ourselves bound. And here you are running a multi-million dollar company feeling like you're a loser, 
feeling like you're less than, feeling like you're in whatever kind of victim, scarcity, ridiculousness, the thing that's going to get you to the next, it's like you have to go through it to get to it. So here's this element. I want to invite you into this like kind of examination or this kind of like pontification. I don't know. It's this element of if things came easy, if you had success, you got into that school you wanted to, you graduated from that school you wanted to, you got that job you wanted, and suddenly you're you know further in your career and things suddenly get hard, you don't have the resilience to face it because everything you do, you came so easy. And so now you think because it's not easy, something must be wrong. Talk to me about seeing that through a different lens. I have a beautiful story I'd love to share with you that came from one of my Kabbalistic teachers many years ago. In addition to meditating at the exact same time, I started meditating and studying Kabbalah about 11 years ago. And what I loved about Kabbalah is it gave me rules. <laughs> like back in the day being autistic, it's like, if this, then you will succeed at life. So I could really follow rules. That's like my gift. I could like insert, repeat, thank you, computer brain. And fast forward, I remember being in a class, I think it was Moshe was one of the teachers, and he gave the most beautiful analogy. He said, I want you to imagine a soccer field. Most of us can think of soccer, wherever you're listening in the world, you're familiar with soccer, what they call football, I think, in Europe. And I'd like you to imagine for a moment, Angus, that you have a soccer net, yet there's no goalie. Is it still a game if you're sitting there or standing there, rather, and kicking a ball into a net all day long and there's no goalie? Is it a game? It's not, right? There's no game. If you're just sitting there kicking a ball into a net, it's not really a game, is it? Because there's no opposition. So here's what they went on to say. They said, you want to look at our lives as though we have this experience, this soccer field, and our goal is to kick the ball in the net. You can think of that as success, enlightenment, whatever it is, getting the ball in the net. Yet in order to make it the game real, you have to have a goalie. The goalie we put there by choice is our opponent, our ego, call it whatever you want from whatever spiritual discipline. It really doesn't matter what you call it, though you want to think of it as though it is there to serve you. So when you have the side of you that say everything has gone smoothly your whole life, you're just winning and winning. You're kicking that ball in the net and there's almost no goalie there, right? You're like, I got this. I'm epic winning. And yet, all of a sudden, one day, this goalie shows up in front of the net in the form of your ego, in the form of obstacles, whatever you might want to consider it. And that is when the game begins. Because now you have the opportunity to earn happiness rather than happiness just being given to you. That's why, statistically speaking, most people, if they're given millions or billions of dollars without having earned it, they can't hold it. They can't contain it. They're it's like, as David Gamm, one of my teachers used to say, it's like plugging a thousand watts of light into a hundred watt light bulb. It'll just short circuit. So too are we as human beings. And I saw this firsthand building my first school in November 2017 in Nepal. I was shocked. I remember it was the most extraordinary experience of my life. I'd always dreamed of taking a portion of our company's proceeds and building schools. And so I arrived there with my mother, my father, my ex-husband were arriving flowers and instruments being played. And I see these children, there is no running water, no toilets, very little electricity if you're lucky, like the wealthiest person might have electricity for a few minutes every day, but it didn't exist. And yet the children in Nepal were 10 times happier than most of the kids I had ever met in the United States, my own nephews and family and people I had known included. So that then got me curious. What if our biggest obstacles are actually our greatest opportunities. I was just writing a story about this today and sharing it with our audience is we have these failures. And yet what if our failures are really our catalysts and our rubber bands that teach us to become resilient, as you put it, that teach us how to build strength. And I'll, I'll give you a wonderful story about this. Uh, in the late 1980s, Angus, there was something called the Biodome. Have you ever heard of it? It was built in Arizona. So yeah, it was for those of you who aren't familiar, they wanted to mimic life in space. So scientists gathered together and they created this contained structure in Arizona called the Biodome. And the goal was to grow plants and animals and vegetables and trees enough to sustain life if we were to live on another planet. 
everything went exactly as planned. They had more than enough food. They were able to sustain themselves, except one thing went horribly awry. Would you like to know what that was, Angus? I think I know what it is, only because I know it the was, story. Was it yeah, wind? You, exactly. So it was the trees, though. The trees grew faster and taller than they had ever grown in natural environments, and yet they fell over before they hit maturity. And it's for the exact reason you just mentioned. The one thing in creating a quote-unquote perfect environment the scientists had failed to take into account was wind. You see, wind is what causes the trees to be able to build what's called stress wood, which allows them to bend with the hurricanes and the movements of the seasons and causes their roots to penetrate deep. Well, it turns out we as humans, too, need the stress wood, although we call it, as humans, eustress, which is healthy stress. So the more healthy stress we have, as long as we don't internalize it and tell our amygdala we're not going to survive, we're being chased by tigers, if we can learn to shift our perspective to, from seeing everything as dangerous tigers to, oh, wow, this is a healthy opportunity for my growth and development, then we too can develop the stress wood, which allows us to stand tall in the face of adversity. I'm trying to come up with a clever line for stress wood. Nothing's coming to me, but I will work on that one because this, I never put that in context of what you just said in the way that we are building our resilience like that wind. That is an amazing metaphor because the challenges that shape us, I would not be who I am had I not gone through what I'd gone through, vice versa, or anyone else. Those things that shape us, create us, and form us are the very things that others may look at and say, well, I'm a victim. Oh, you don't understand, Angus. My dad was an alcoholic. Oh, you don't understand. Um, I was adopted. Oh, you don't understand. Um, I grew up on the other side of the tracks. You don't understand. And then we can go and we can put in and fill in those blanks with all sorts of excuses and reasons that may be absolutely true, absolutely valid, absolutely horrendous. And yet, what's the story we tell ourselves about what that impact of that thing does in our life? Does it tear us down? Or does it build us up? Did it, was it something brought against us and something to make us feel smaller? Or was it something that came against us to bring us higher? I was in a conversation this week and I talked about, you know, just the metaphor of resistance. When our lives face resistance, it's the only way a, a large aircraft can get off the ground is resistance. According to physics, resistance under the wing actually lifts the plane to greater heights. In the same way in our own life, the, resistances we f the res resistance we face, the things that come against us are actually there to take us higher if we will harness it, if we'll yield to it, if we'll let go of the control of trying to manipulate and manufacture whatever thing we think we can. Beautiful analogy. I love that. It's the resistance that allows us to fly. Mm hmm. 100%. All right. So I want to bring this into a landing here. You uh, also have your own company now. You went from, you know, going through Kabbalah and following all these different kind of spiritual adventures and building schools in Nepal and hanging out with all these great minds and thinkers. And now you're like, you know what? I think I want to be a SaaS founder. Tell us about <laughs> Optimatch. Yeah, that was rather serendipitous how that came about. A lot of the kudos goes to Moon Cho and Julian Adler. So in 2020, after I had now, all I had to do was consult remotely for the company that I had sold, which was amazing. The team took it over. They're still successful and doing great, which is like makes your heart happy. And fast forward to that year, I'm going on croissant hunts with my husband in Paris, just enjoying long, long walks, enjoying semi-retirement, so-called. And uh, I get a phone call. I was actually at a spiritual retreat with this woman's sister, Jenna, and I get introduced to this woman, Moon Cho, who asked me to co-found a company with her to help match coaches and therapists with uh, different people and patients and so forth around the world. And she said, Jen, why don't we come up with some sort of special algorithm? Well, I insisted on bringing in my old business coach, Julian Adler. He's extraordinary. He helped me sell the last company. I wouldn't have been able to sell it without him. And so when Julian and Moon and I were on a call one day, Julian said, well, Jen, you're so good at naturally connecting people. Why don't we just build an algorithm based on your intuition? And I was like, 
what? <laughs> like, so in addition to Julian being this extraordinary coach, he was also a software engineer by trade. So we spent about eight months developing, going back and forth around the mathematics, very complex math, to create a formula that asks 20 questions and ascertains what are you motivated by? And then we cram up with a system of how to overlay those matches. And we tested it in our mar uh, marketplace. We had about 100 coaches and therapists around the world that we had personally vetted. And we tested it. We got to an 87% satisfaction rate. We're like, whoa. <laughs> so then fast forward, I go to pitch my first VC. I think it was in um, summer of 2022. And the VC says very directly to me, I don't give a crap about your energy marketplace and this, the therapists and the coaches and all these great people you're working with. He said, I want to know, can you do this in mass? Can you plug this in via API to any existing marketplace, to dentists, to coaches, to all these people and do that? And I said, well, yeah, we could. And through a series of serendipities, a CEO I was coaching at the time happened to hear that pitch and was on the call and private messages me on Zoom and says, Jen, you have been so instrumental in mentoring me over the last year. Why don't I project manage the whole thing for you for free and do it for you at cost? Because you've been extraordinary. And next thing you know, I was accidentally the CEO of a SaaS company. And we just have finished implementing. Uh, we're not at release candidate one yet, but we are in that MVP stage and just rolling it out. So it's been so much fun. We're working with startups. We're working with HR companies, consultants. They're, we're overwhelmed by all the different ways that people want to use this because we've had such a high success rate. And so we're just building out the widget for the API. And we have a lot of consultants and people who like to pay the monthly fee just so that they can run their own matching reports. So say they have clients and they want to measure coherence within teams or amongst team members, then all they have to do is have any team members answer the matching questions and it pulls up beautiful reports. So it's been an adventure. If you had told me 10, 20 years ago, one day you'll be the CEO of a tech company, I would have said, you're off your mind. Like, no, <laughs> that's not going to happen. And yet you just kind of follow the breadcrumbs to where they lead you. And now you're probably going to get to, if you haven't already, implementing some of your own practices into being the leader that you need to be for this company. If someone is listening to this and they want some tools that they could look into that's going to help them better understand themselves, better build this consciousness, better build this uh, understanding of the goalie that they're putting in their own net to uh, get to this place of learning about their inner child, their meditation, like any of these pieces, what are some tools you would tell them to explore? So I wrote a book about that in 2020 called 101 Spiritual Tools for Uncertain Times. And I got through book one, which I think was 11 tools, if I'm not mistaken. And a few of my favorites are some of the ones that we've talked about. Inner child work, meditation. I love mantra work as well. Another one of my favorite things that I do every day that I love to teach people is what's called spiritual accounting. It started off as something I'd learned, again, from one of my Kabbalistic teachers, where you reflect every night proactively, not reactively, on how you could have lived today better, what you're most proud of yourself for, and what you're grateful for. Now, the reason we do this proactively is so often we are stewing in self-loathing of, oh, I didn't do this right, I didn't do that right. And yet if we choose proactively to reflect upon our day without judgment, just looking at it like, oh, gosh, how could I have lived today better? Oh, I was a little rude to that person. Okay. And nobody else ever has to know about this. I write it on the notes section of my phone every night before bed. And then what was really cool about that is that evolved at the end of 2020. There was a brilliant man I met named Dr. Todd Ovakaitis. So I was feeling pretty good about myself, like patting myself on the back for doing this every night, right? And uh, Dr. Todd challenged me in an interview we did. He said, Jennifer, I'm going to ask you to do three more things in addition to your evening practice. And I said, oh, okay. I thought I was doing pretty good, but I'm open to it. Bring it on. And he said, I want you to also write down the moments of awe, synchronicity, and miracles every day. Because what happens, and then this kind of evolved totally out of the blue. People just started asking me, well, how do I have more miracles in my life? So I started teaching miracle making classes and I'm in the midst of a mastermind actually on miracle making and hearing the miracles the students are getting is blowing my mind, Angus. It's so humbling and I'm so grateful. Like the stuff that I just kind of do for my own edification for the sheer joy of doing it, like writing down my miracles every day. One of the things I teach our students is that if you want to be able to cultivate these grandiose miracles, finding your soulmate, your dream job, millions of dollars, your dream home, whatever that looks like to you, 
then first you have to recognize the micro miracles. So I encourage people every day to write down the little miracles that maybe you take for granted. And then as you begin to illuminate and look for that, then you begin to appreciate the bigger miracles. And actually, funny story, there was a brilliant thought leader I'd interviewed several years back who had taught me a game called How Does Life? get any better than this. And the idea of the game is every time something a little bit good happens, a little micro miracle happens, you know, maybe there's no wait at Starbucks. I don't know. I make it up. That's a miracle. If you've ever been to Starbucks, that could be a miracle. <laughs> you know, so you write, you think to yourself and you say out loud, how does life get better than this? Well, two funny things about this. One, when I learned this game in 2017, it was July of 2017 when this uh, gentleman had joined me for the show. I started playing that game every day. I would text with a friend of mine about it every day. I'd say, how does life get better than this? One month to the day after I started playing that game, Angus, somebody messages me on LinkedIn and offers to buy my company out of the blue. So that was one, story number one. Story number two, a dear friend of mine was listening to a recent episode I was doing on my Regarding Consciousness show, and she happened to hear me talking, about a get, talking with a guest about this. And she said, Jen, that was so inspiring. I'm going to start playing that every day. And I said, well, why don't we do one better? Why don't we text each other every day to hold each other accountable? Just one line. We don't have to talk. How does life get better than this? So now for about the last seven or eight months, we text each other every day. How does life get better than this? Just as a little mnemonic and reminder, she has been selling out of every product she has on TikTok for six months in advance. She was one of the early beta testers of TikTok shop. So I just love it. How does life get any better than this? So those are a few of my favorite tools. I love that one. It almost gets me a little teary, actually, uh, because I I know even the life that we've created, just sometimes we pinch yourself and, and it feels magical. And what else? Like the world is a place of abundance and overflow, source and supply, and whatever we want to uh, pull from it, it's, it's at our back end call. Like we have the abilities to create better relationships and better opportunities and better possibilities. And if I were to leave you listener, if you're listening in your car, or in your home, if you're mowing the lawn, if you're washing the dishes, like wherever you're at, whatever you're doing, you're that powerful. That whatever you're going through, whatever you're experiencing, whatever challenge in funding or revenue or income, whatever challenge you're having in relationships with marriage or your children or your extended family, anything you're experiencing in your self-doubt or imposter syndrome or your sense of, of value, know this, you are worth more than you think you are. You are capable of more than you think you are. And you are invited into this world to show up as your full enlightened and conscious self. And it doesn't have to be woo. It doesn't have to be uh, different or awkward outside of any of scope. All you have to do is give it new words to something that feels right to you. Don't see some of these things as other. Invite them in as possible for you. Don't see some of these things that maybe you've never heard of or feel awkward about as something that's not possible to you. Chase the curiosity, chase your intuition, chase that spirit that's inside of you that's craving for alignment, for acceptance, for belonging, for being. Thanks so much for watching or listening to the show. Have an incredible day. As we wrap up another episode of Evolve Leadership, thank you so much for taking time to invest in you. If there's to be any sustainable growth in your company or even in your relationships, you must grow first. And it's what I love to do for leaders, to help them grow, to challenge their thinking, sharpen self-awareness, to instill an unshakable confidence, and ultimately upgrade their sense of self. And we do this through our proprietary method called Agile EQ+, where we're leveraging agile leadership and emotional intelligence. We provide our signature training for individuals and for businesses, we've designed a unique curriculum for company-wide learning and development. If you'd like to learn more about our training or to schedule a call, you can simply go to evolveleadership.org. And until next time, stay driven, keep climbing, and never stop evolving.